Uh, so we have joining us tonight, Tom Nichols. Um, he is a Philadelphia based author, journalist, playwright, and a recipient of the 2005 Philadelphia uh, AIA Lewis Mumford Award for Architectural Journalism. He's the author of 15 books, including Literary Philadelphia, Philadelphia Architecture, Philadelphia Mansions. This guy's pretty busy. Um, he writes for City Journal, New York, the Philadelphia Irish Edition, the Philadelphia Free Press, and Delaware Valley Journal. So tonight he's going to be talking to us about his latest book, From Mother Divine to the Corner Swami, Religious Cults in Philadelphia. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Thomas, and welcome. Thank you, Judy, for the intro. Uh, I should say a few things about my background, because I think it would probably help to understand how I became interested in religions and odd religions and then cults. Um, I grew up in Chester County at a time when being Catholic was pretty much like being Mennonite or an alien or an outright foreigner. It was a very, very Protestant area. And so Catholics were really considered oddities. So I did experience sort of being looked at as a boy as a kind of peculiar, uh, <laughs> um, a person who was a member of a peculiar strange religion with a lot of myth attached to it. Um, and I should say that in Chester County at the time, um, well, that's about all that I should say about Chester County. Um, my book, let me read you some of the chapter titles. And I think that'll give you a sense of where the book goes in terms of its, uh, of its scope. Um, there's a chapter entitled Father and Mother Divine, The Cultic Lore of Philadelphia Psychics, When the Secular Meets the Religious, Earth Day and the Rise of the Secular Guru, Cults That Have Become Mainstream, and here I talk about the LDS or the Mormon Church, uh, Philadelphia's Pop-Up Messiahs, the Empire Cult of Scientology, Harry Krishna to all and to all a good night, T for two, the cult of theophysy, processing Satan, Philadelphia's radical fairies, and the cultic scenic Amish. So I begin with the story of Mother and Father Divine, which is a mayor, a many layered Byzantine story. And um, but before I do that, I'm just going to explain um, that in the academic world, of course, the word cult is rarely used. I think nowadays we hear terms like new religious movements. And, um, but I think that's a cumbersome phrase. And, um, and I think cults will probably be around for a long time. Now, personally, I would define a cult as an organization of followers that disbands or dies out when their leader dies. Whereas of course in an established church, a new leader, be that a Pope, Bishop or Rabbi is elected and appointed in the leader's place. Um, cults can harbor absolute authoritarianism. So forget about critical inquiry. A cult of course generally encourages unreasonable fears about the outside world. Uh, financial records are also never revealed, and followers who leave are often considered evil, or in some instances tracked down and harassed, which is what they really used to do in Scientology. That tends not to be the case now because there's been a lot of focus on Scientology. Um, now, the leader in a conventional cult has ultimate personal authority, which really goes, goes far beyond the abstract institutional power of a bishop in a church. Um, Jim Jones, for instance, of Jonestown infamy, would go up to his many male and female followers and tell them that they were being called to offer their bodies to him in a physical union. And everybody obeyed, even the most heterosexual of men. 
Um, now, cults have also become increasingly secular, um, given the national obsession with politics and how that keeps growing. Uh, politics for many people indeed has become a kind of orthodox religion with cultish overturns. And so that's why in my book, I tend to focus on some political organizations without revealing my personal bias. And even in a fun way, cults can be a manner of dress and feeling, such as living in Powhatan Village or in Mount Airy. So there's a, there's a whimsical side to the book. Um, Mother Divine died in 2017. There was a big headline in the New York Times that stated Mother Divine who took over her husband's cult dies at 91. Now, actually this was the first time that I had seen the word cult in reference to the peace mission movement used by such a hefty mainstream journalistic source. Um, now, of course, um, Mother Divine actually died on March 4th. The headline didn't appear until March um, 14th. Um, she was a mysterious figure as figures go. She was born Edna Rose Richings in Vancouver in 1925. Um, she first became fascinated by Father Divine at the age of 15. And um, she predicted that she would one day become his wife. She was attracted to Father Divine's movement because it preached the gospel of self-help, economic uh, independence, and social equality. Um, now, Father Divine attracted a huge following initially in Harlem, where he maintained his first headquarters, and his various missions were known as heavens. Um, as I said, um, the Mother Divine claimed that the revelation came to her in 1950 that Father Divine is God. And most of the people who followed Father Divine believed that he was God. And if you ever went to one of their holy communion banquets, which was their only version of a religious service, um, it was an elaborate meal that lasted about two hours, very formal, the most delicious food I've ever tasted, all homegrown vegetables, various meats, an endless assortment of desserts, um, a very, very crowded dining room. There was always an empty chair which was presented as the seat where Father Divine was present in the spirit. And during the entire length of the meal, one heard recordings of Father Divine's sermons. I can't say it was the most, it was the most fascinating thing, but as an archival audio experience, it was truly fascinating. Um, now, Father Divine, as I said, was, was thought of as God by his followers, but Father Divine himself did not believe that he was really God. He told his adopted son, Tommy Garcia, um, and that's another story in itself, and I will get into that, that he was not God. But if people wanted to believe that he was, he wasn't going to contradict them. When Father Divine died, um, the whole MO at the Peace Mission movement at the Woodmont Mansion in Gladwin changed. Um, according to Tommy, he was required to stand at Mother Divine's side during the lengthy funeral ceremonies, during which no one was permitted to show any expressions of sorrow. And Mother Divine was pretty strict about this. If, if anyone cried, Mother Divine had them removed uh, on the spot. Uh, Mother Divine also banished a number of women who had been close to Father Divine after Father Divine's death, such as Miss Mary Bloom and Miss Dorothy Darling. These names mean nothing to you, but when somebody joined the peace mission movement, they were usually given new names. Now, these two women were sent to live at the Circle Mission Church at the corner of Broad and Catherine Streets. It was an all-female living enclave. 
as I said, they were the closest to Father Divine. They were also higher ups and they wielded a lot of power. Um, now, obviously, Mother Divine felt threatened by them, and I think she had good reason to. Um, Mother Divine, after all, and in the last analysis, was what they used to call a trophy wife. Um, she was Father Divine's second wife. His first wife, Panaya, died some years before. Now, the sad thing, I think, is that after Father Divine's death, Mother Divine herself then began to think of herself as a deity. And with that thought in mind, she would then banish anyone who had doubts about that. If anyone questioned her authority, let's say that Mother Divine said, I want 14 purple roses arranged in that vase in 12 minutes. If you didn't do it, you were actually banished. Now, Mother Divine's life as a widow in Woodmont was marked by many public appearances where she would show up in fine furs and jewelry. She appeared quite often in the society pages of the Philadelphia Inquirer and the Philadelphia Bulletin. But as she aged, she became more and more remote and the circle around her was becoming increasingly secretive. In 2008, Mother Divine told Tommy, Tommy Garcia, her adopted son, that they are keeping me locked in my room. I met Mother Divine in June of 2010 when I visited the estate at Woodmont. I was invited with an artist friend of mine uh, because he was painting some of the interiors. He was gonna do a series of paintings for a book that he was doing. So we attended the meal and we had, we had a private interview with Mother Divine after the meal. Um, now, my first view of her was I had walked into the mansion and I saw her descending the grand staircase in the Woodmont Mansion, dressed in an all white ball gown while being escorted by an attendant or a rosebud dressed in red, who also wore a small red beret tilted to the side in the style of Shea Shavara. The scene was really straight out of the movie Sunset Boulevard. Mother Divine had snow white hair and skin that seemed much paler than the color of Dove's soap. That's how I described it in my book. She did carry herself with a confident elegance, her head was erect and her eyes focused on some invisible point on the horizon. You really had a sense when you met her that you were meeting somebody important. And it was as if she had studied old newsreels of Queen Elizabeth. She had the whole royalty patina down straight. Um, we attended the banquet, as I said, where the platters, when they're passed from diner to diner, are never allowed to touch the table. So you must then get what you need put it on your plate and pass the platter to the person beside you. You weren't allowed to, to hold two platters at the same time. The net effect of this in the dining room was the strange synchronization of the plates that kind of had the movements of a dance. And as I said before, the diners listened to old audio tapes of Father Divine's sermons. Most of the people, most of the diners were elderly. They were elderly men in suits and women in peace mission uniforms. Um, they combined eating with the singing of hymns. Um, a, quite a number of the elderly white women were European by birth. They were born in Denmark and Norway, and they clapped their hands in a sing-song fashion in between mouthfuls. This was kind of disconcerting to me for a while because it it seemed I mean, there were elements almost of a, a benign mental institution. Um, but after dinner, our mother was her great gracious self. She invited us into her private office, which used to be Father Divine's office. And she showed us old photographs of Father Divine. Now, as I said, this had been Father Divine's office. 
And it was modeled, Mother Divine said, on the office of the J.F. Kennedy Oval Office in the White House. And it was really a time capsule. And, and in some ways, I expected to see little JFK Jr. crawl out from under Father Divine's old desk at any moment. At all times in the room, there were two or three dour looking rosebuds who stood beside Mother Divine as the four of us chatted. Um, so we were never really alone. Um, the conversation was not profound, but it was filled with cursory pleasantries. And of course, there were lots of photo ops. Um, one thing about the peace mission movement is that, is that early on, oh, I must say, <laughs> before I get to that, is that Father Divine's adopted son, Tommy Garcia, was molested on his second night at the Woodmont Mansion by the head of security. Uh, Tommy Garcia was eight years old. He had been forced to room with an older man because people were not permitted to sleep alone, even though Tommy had special status as the adopted son of Father Divine. Um, the next day, Tommy told Father Divine what had happened and the head of security was then fired. But this problem did persist throughout the peace mission movement. There was a strict segregation of the sexes. And it's Tommy Garcia's view that this led to some same-sex activity. Um, now, Father Divine preached a uh, celibate lifestyle. Um, that, however, with Father Divine behind the lens was not really true. He had many assorted um, um, assassinations, <laughs> um, alliances, which is probably a less funny word, with various women. Uh, Mother Divine herself, though, led a life of duplicity. Um, she could live a celibate lifestyle with Father Divine because actually, according to Tommy Garcia, she was lesbian. And Mother Divine arranged private massage sessions there with her female Peace Mission members. Um, all the doors in the Peace Mission movement at Gladwin were unlocked. So at any point, anybody could walk inside a room. And this was also true for Mother Divine who had a black female roommate. She did not sleep with Father Divine. So anyone after Mother Divine became a widow who walked in on Mother Divine getting a massage was um, immediately banished from the estate because that tale could not be told. I did notice one sad thing during my visit to Woodmont and that was while in the cab leaving the estate, we passed Mother Divine as she began her daily walk escorted by several rosebuds. Apparently after lunch, they had this nature walk around much of the acreage. And um, she looked very, very weak and vulnerable from the taxi cab window. And in fact, she seemed to me to be almost totally under the care and the direction of the women propping her up. And when I say direction, I mean, I almost want to use the word authority um, because the word care in this sense can also be a code word for power and control. Uh, Mother, uh, Father Divine's adopted son also told me after my visit to Woodmont that at that point, Mother Divine was really a prisoner in the Grand Estate. And yet this strange and wonderful woman who I really liked when I met her and our brief interview with her was very, very forthcoming. She was very open despite the presence of an extremely sour looking rosebud who stood right beside her. Um, this was a woman who actually saved the peace mission movement from Jim Jones's People's Temple movement. 
I could go back to the late spring of 1971 when Jim Jones, who had visited Woodmont before when Father Divine was alive, contacted Mother Divine and asked to visit her at Woodmont. She was agreeable and in her new role as head of the peace mission movement, she often received visitors throughout the world. Now Jones came from California with 200 of his followers to accompany him on the trip. They came in school buses. And when they arrived at Woodmont, he explained to Mother Divine that Father Divine had failed in his mission and that he died before completing his life's work. And Jones also believed that it was his calling to lead the peace mission movement down the path followed by People's Temple. Well, um, at that point, Mother Divine had pretty keen intuition. She may have been a so-called trophy wife and she may have loved grand things, but she knew evil when she saw it. She um, immediately ordered Jim Jones off the premises. And so the next day, the People's Temple buses took three days to make the cross country trip back to California. Um, they did, however, win a number of converts to the peace mission movement. Um, these converts were very, very old with health problems and all of them died shortly after arriving in California. So moving on to a to somebody who was quite a figure on the Philadelphia scene, the secular political green cult of Ira Einhorn. Um, in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, it seems that only exotic Eastern religions made inroads into the army of patchouli oil wearing counterculture people. Um, religion or spiritual or uh, spirituality was otherwise really dead. Um, for the spiritually indifferent, total submersion into the culture, politics and revolution was all that was needed to keep body and soul together. Now, when LSD first appeared on the scene, it was as a consciousness raising drug rather than a party drug. Users were not looking to get a cheap high but to experience a series of breakthrough moments that might aid them in their understanding of the riddle of life. I remember in the late 1960s, a Harvard professor friend of mine who was an avid LSD advocate advised me, raising your consciousness the normal way can take years, but LSD provides a shortcut. It's absolutely serious. Provided, of course, the drug doesn't short circuit your brain and cause you to jump out a window. Now, my professor friend offered no answers as to life riddles, uh, why we live, why we die, what if anything happens after death. He rarely, if ever, spoke on these topics. LSD was all about colors and seeing into people. It was about learning to appreciate the present moment, contemplating the tree and being able to see it as a living, breathing organism. It was about being able to see and feel the truth of the unity and the oneness of all created beings. Yet this sacramental approach to LSD was very, very short lived. In no time at all, it seemed LSD became the new high wire party drug. Um, you know, it became one to see the inner workings of a mushroom that will remind you of a jellyfish or how about experiencing the wallpaper in a room expanding in and out like a pair of human lungs. An artist acquaintance of mine when I lived in Boston took LSD and became convinced that he could fly. So he promptly jumped out of the window of a high rise apartment building. His death came as a shock to his bohemian circle of friends, but it did not deter others from experimenting with the drugs. Now, Philadelphia's high priest of psychedelics, Ira Samuel Einhorn, was born in 1940 to a nice couple named B and Joseph Einhorn. He, was, he had a brother, Stephen, who was born later, but the family favorite was Ira, a lover of books who as a boy would read far into the night. And the fact that his uncontrolled precociousness 
was often a problem for te teachers and family. Powhatan Village was Philadelphia's Bohemia, the place that housed its outcasts, fringe characters, mavericks, and lunatics, along with a number of people, possibly the majority in 1963, who were just plain poor. Located only a few blocks north of the University of Pennsylvania and virtually abutting the growing, the growing campus of Drexel, the Powhatan Village was an ambial enclave of declining Victorian homes on quiet streamlined streets with a dash of ghetto tenements mixed in. Now, Guru Einhorn had a large group of people visiting him all the time. He would sit in a semicircle around his elevated position on a window seat while he expounded on LSD and Marshall McLuhan. His reputation as a seer was growing and people listened to him as they would listen to a medium. Einhorn survived by borrowing money from friends and family and then dealing a little marijuana on the side. Later corporations and organizations would pay high dollars to hear him speak on the coming new age and its impact on technology. Or they would treat him to daily expensive lunches at the French eatery at La Terrasse in University City. In Einhorn's case, it was all about giving Iron his due because he was Ira. He was called the mayor of Palatin, and Ira knew everybody, Allen Ginsberg, John Cage, Julian Beck of the Living Theater, Alan Watts, Jerry Rubin, and the Mothers of Invention rock group. A Philadelphia magazine writer who profiled Einhorn then commented, he was a terrible writer. His poetry has been described as Whitman-esque Yelp, and he wrote in block capital letters. When Don DiMeo started The Distant Drummer, Philadelphia's premier underground newspaper in 1967, Einhorn went to the newspaper's office on Pine Street and demanded a column. In the 1970s, uh, he did get the column, by the way, but when he submitted his first column, everything was in caps and the editor had him rewrite it. He was not too happy about that. In the 1970s, there were many pop-up gurus in Powhatan Village. I know one such guru, a gay naturist, who held his own brand of nudist marijuana-laced consciousness raising parties in which the all-male participants took off their clothes, sat in a circle on the floor, and when sufficiently stoned, submitted to the guru's sexual commands. A guru must be obeyed in all things after all. Um, I do talk about MOVE and um, Philadelphia's Powhatan Village neighborhood during the MOVE years from the late 1970s until the 1986 bombing. I must, I must uh, preface this with the comment that this part of MOVE's history is gradually being lost. And because this is an unpleasant part um, that certain revisionists don't like to hear, but it's a part of the truth. It's a, it's a part of the true legacy of what happened. I was there and I saw it. Um, I remember walking through the West Philadelphia neighborhood and hearing the bullhorn shrieks of MOVE members shouting obscenities. Now word clarity was not always a component of these presentations. So everything came across as a gibberish turn to static because of the bad microphone. MOVE claimed to be revolutionary, but it was out of step with most of the popular political movements current at that time, such as the gay rights movement, which had an important ally in the University of Pennsylvania. Oddly enough, MOVE started out as an almost fundamentalist Christian group. Um, the Gays at Penn lecture series was a popular seasonal event that brought many prominent gay and lesbian thinkers and activists to the Penn stage. Several of the lectures were raided by MOVE members who stormed the stage while chanting obscene chants about homosexuals. Through the years, MOVE protesters also raised their voices against a wide range of persons, including the Reverend Jexie Jackson, the Quakers, and the Communist Party. 
this unhinged ideological hodgepodge made the group really hard to understand. Um, so the passage of time, as I said, has erased many of these blatant historic assaults against the city and the Palton Village neighborhood. I, I do talk about the cult of yoga, which has become quite popular and is often seen as primarily just an exercise community of people who just want to exercise. Um, in my Fishtown Northern Liberties Philadelphia neighborhood, many of the young women in their 20s and 30s wear tight black yoga pants. The men also wear them as well. Uh, yoga pants have become the uniform of sorts like bell bottoms and love beads in the 1960s. Many but not all of the women who dress this way have incorporated yoga into their daily lives. Yoga, as I said, has become big business, big enough to accommodate hundreds in a rehab warehouse near the Market Frankfurt L station at Frankfurt and Girard. Now, all yoga, of course, is at the heart of the New Age movement, and it, it all comes from India. Yoga, it might be said, is the heart of Hinduism, despite the many different schools of Hindu practice. Um, it, it is often said that exercise yoga is just that, and that it's not religious at all. But what I've found in my research is that at the outset, this is very, very true. Many of these yoga exercise industries, um, um, in the beginning, there are no mantras involved or instructors who, who are like wannabe control gurus. But I have also read of instances of how some yoga instructors assume more and more power as the class as the class moves along so that eventually the student practitioner comes to see the instructor as something much more than someone who shows them how to flex or stand on their heads. These teachers become total life teachers with specific guidelines on how to live your life from food, sex, fasting, far outside the simple exercise of yoga. Now, this Personal invasion happens so gradually at first, it may not be noticeable to many, although the first red flag may be when the exercise instructor suggests a light mantra to accompany exercise. One mantra leads to two mantras, and after that might come a repetition of alms. And before you know it, you have a yoga class that is tipping into the tenets of Hinduism. Not a bad thing if that's where your interests lie, but if you only want to go to a yoga class for exercise, it's kind of misleading. Um, now yoga, like Ben and Jerry's ice cream, has developed many different styles. There, uh, there's actually a baby yoga, there's a mama yoga, there's laughing yoga, super brain yoga, beer yoga, drunk yoga, and yoga and wine. Yoga covers the waterfront. Um, Yoga today is mostly a female dominated practice. And while there has been a tiny upswing in male participation, the truth is that yoga is perceived as being much more conducive to the female body with its built-in ability to twist in pretzel-like discombobulations. Most men are just not that flexible and do not see yoga as providing a sufficient workout routine. Um, one Huffington Post article that I read explained that men might also be turned off by the various spiritual aspects of the practice, such as om chanting or naming poses in Sanskrit. Now, I also talk about the cult of Philly Jesus in my book. The phenomenon of the cult of Philly Jesus is apparent to anyone who happens upon numerous YouTube videos of Philly Jesus going about his mission in the city. Of course, this was true pre-COVID, um, including baptizing a man in Love Fountain near City Hall. Now, how could anyone, one might wonder, be so gullible as to believe that a baptism by a fake Jesus was somehow more real than a baptism in a church? Well, um, no sooner 
then I asked this question, then I understood the reasoning. Um, everything in the society is about appearances. Well, almost. Philly Jesus, AKA Michael Grant, was a hot media sensation at the time of the YouTube baptism filming. People who buy into celebrity culture want easy answers. And Philly Jesus is the perfect man for that. It's easy, for instance, to imagine how it all started for him. Probably a close friend said, you know, your face and eyes and the way your beard hangs, you look a lot like Jesus. So work in the world of marketing and public relations, find a better story than Grant's. An admitted ex-heroin addict, what has Mr. Grant not seen on the mean streets of the city? Rejection, starvation, dirty needles, homelessness, dirty clothes and days without a shower, not to mention unseemly ways to make money. It's a certainty that Philly Jesus has been to hell and back, but now that he is resurrected and clean, his beard fluffed up and his piercing eyes aflame, he is a real showman. Now, the day that Michael Grant put on the Jesus robes, the city opened up for him. The local paparazzi went crazy because they were hungry for something new. Since Philly Jesus was, was not just another Philadelphia style magazine night crawler, pre-COVID of course, sucking on martini olives, his picture was soon everywhere. The effect of all this PR was that soon people were going to Philly Jesus for authentic spiritual counseling. In a series of online photographs by CBS3, for instance, one can see Philly Jesus praying with the homeless, counseling strangers, conversing with addicts, praying in the Parkway Cathedral, and walking through North Philadelphia carrying a huge wooden cross. In other photos, he is skateboarding or playing hockey because, you know, Philly Jesus is cool. In Philly Jesus' counseling the week photos, he looks very sage-like with his arms around a homeless man. What words of wisdom was the savior imparting, you might ask? In this photo, one can see that he has ceased being an actor, but is actually beginning to take himself seriously. As Philly Jesus told one interviewer, I have to grow. I have to take it to the next level. But the next level meaning what? <clears throat> Now, if Michael Grant thought it would be fun being Philly Jesus, he was in for a rude awakening. When you stroke the mame of the paparazzi, you have to do certain things right to keep them coming back. That sounds like an old Mae West quote. You have to be the kind of Jesus that does not exclude anybody. During the month of June, Philly Jesus lent his support to the 50th anniversary of the historic gay rights protest at Independence Hall. The paparazzi photographed him smiling and waving among a mostly LGBT crowd. In one photo, you see him standing near a drag queen in Henry David, Philadelphia's Mr. Halloween. Then when the Supreme Court voted in favor of same-sex marriage, Philly Jesus said that the ruling was a very good thing and that he approved. Then the backlash. Did the Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage inspire some to contact Philly Jesus for a spiritual rehabilitation? The prospect of alienating conservative or even the bulk of Christians was not something Philly Jesus wanted to do. After all, he had his future fundraising efforts and his Jesus ministry project to think about. What would happen to his financial contributions? Being Jesus is a bit like walking on eggshells. Philly Jesus, in a quick turnabout, announced that he was sorry for his positive comments on marriage. I want to publicly apologize to all of you, he said, and ask for your forgiveness. I repent in Jesus' name. On his Facebook page, he spewed a harder dose of medicine. Gay pride is why Sodom got fried, he wrote. At least it rhymes. The instantaneous change baffled many of his fans. The real Jesus from Nazareth never had to correct himself, never had to say that he was wrong when he said something the first time. In one fell swoop, Philly Jesus' love affair with the media seemed to evaporate. Now, Philadelphia in the 1980s and the 90s 
was a hotbed of new age philosophers and do-it-yourself swamis. Um, there was a magazine at the time called New Frontier Magazine. And there were interviews with past life uh, mediums who recorded their adventures in um, hypnotizing people. There were ads for crystals, ads for the uh, Garden of, of Letters uh, bookstore. This was, um, this was well before Philadelphia's alternative press reading public kind of adopted a more humanistic view um, and, and intellectual rather than going the route of the new age. Um, I remember that there were ads in New Frontier for visiting yogas or Indian god women, as they call them. They usually made appearances at the Unitarian Church at 21st and Chestnut Street. The founder of New Frontier magazine was a man named Swami Nostradamus Verato, formerly Joseph Banicus, but also known as the Slimy Tomato. Born into a Lithuanian family in Brooklyn in 1938, he was a smart kid with an introspective and scholastic bent. He first realized that he was able to tap into mystical realms at the age of nine while praying in a Catholic church in Brooklyn. At that time, he said that he saw Jesus Christ come to him in spiritual, physical form. After completing college, the future Swami entered the corporate world, married and had three children. His biography states that he was even a member of the local junior chamber of commerce. This is all solid citizen stuff. It certainly had the makings of a future city council member. Then something happened. Banks walked out on his family in 1972 and adopted the life of a cosmic drifter, a vagabond in search of truth. In 1976, he recalls how he was struck by two flashes of light from above while walking in New York City. The experience, he said, allowed him to enter into a, a fulfilled state of consciousness where his intuitive abilities and his attitude towards life changed. The experience caused him to leave the corporate world in 1979, after which he traveled to India, where he studied meditation and Eastern philosophy. A year later, he was initiated by the famous guru, Asho Waigam Sherhi Raganesh, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, and accepted the new name of Varato. Varato lived on South Street before his departure to Asheville North Carolina in 1994. His work at that time included the management of a holistic detoxification and meditation re retreat 20 miles outside of Asheville. He felt that Philadelphia was overly crowded and that the region in general was falling victim to dangerous sprawl. While he seemed to find some peace and comfort in Asheville, he once complained that he had a car stolen one block away from the public access television uh, TV station where he worked as a producer. He was also afraid that Asheville, now that it had been discovered as a rustic mountain sophisticated hideaway, would in time be ruined by its own popularity. That in fact is actually happening now. In 2007, he complained that you can't even walk the streets of Philadelphia or New York City. Vitro hated crack smokers and was not a fan of smoking marijuana in the street. So we probably would not be happy with today's Philadelphia where you cannot go anywhere without smelling the odor of marijuana. Um, Verato died on February 2nd, 2013 in a hospice in Asheville with his wife by his side. In one photograph he has shown lying in repose, I think I have that photo on the queue, with a feather in his hand, a happy expression on his face. Um, in one online obituary, there were comments both pro and con about his life and legacy. Um, I think everybody gets a pro and con list about their legacy. 
Raja was the first person to open my eyes about Tantra back in Philadelphia in the 1970s. Marilyn Lois Pollock told me. I loved the New Frontier magazine. He was a bit fake with his approach to Tantra and women, including me, just wanted to seduce whatever he could and pretend to show what Tantra really was. But I am grateful that he opened my eyes to it. It was actually the beginning of my path. I'm gonna talk about Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna provided that spiritual niche for many, many seekers. It was Eastern and exotic. It meant shaving your head and wearing a small ponytail, <clears throat> donning orange saffron robes, painting a stripe or two on your face. It meant separating yourself from a material-based culture and giving up much of your individual identity for the sake of the collective. In many ways, it was the perfect spiritual home for the disaffected hippie. The Krishna temple was also a far more refined and transcendental space than those free love based hippie communes whose only code of ethics seemed to be the whole earth catalog. Ironically, the Krishna moral code, the rules and regulations governing how individual devotees should behave <clears throat> were and are as orthodox as the rules in Christian monastic communities. Krishna devotees were expected to be celibate if not married and sexual outlets like masturbation and homosexuality are extremely forbidden. A Krishna marriage was expected to last a lifetime and the idea was to produce children rather than design a cozy birth control plan for the comfort of the parents. Divorce was not permitted. <clears throat> the Krishna temple vegetarian feast, after all, attracted and continue to attract many temple outsiders who do not identify as Krishna believers. For many people, a Krishna experience is mainly about the food. That is why for many young men and women in the 1960s and 70s, Krishna temples were rites of passage experiences. It made sense in those hippie counterculture days for a smart young man intent on bucking the status quo to do a stint in a Vermont hippie commune, work a month or two with the Socialist Workers Party, then take a month long Ken Kesey style road trip and then do five months in a Krishna temple. The regular appearance of Hare Krishna groups at rock concerts and anti-war events in, in Philadelphia during the height of the counterculture era was for me an indication that some people were beginning to see the limits of free love. In those days, I saw the emergence of Hare Krishna as a barometer of things to come. Often I'd ask myself in an era of, of total personal freedom, why were some young people at the height of their youth and beauty, turning to self-denial. Hare Krishna temples, or communes rather, minus the inclusion of women, were very much like Christian monasteries, as I said. Devotees rose early, spent hours chanting in prayer, ate a restricted vegetarian diet, and were expected to perform certain tasks for the benefit of the community. I visited the Germantown Mount Airy Krishna Temple several times in the 1970s. I went because of the food and because a particularly hip vegetarian friend who drank too much liked the chanting, incense, and cymbal clanging prior to the splendid vegetarian feast. Now during my time at temple feasts, I noticed that many of the devotees seemed to be excessively skinny people. Some in fact were sickly looking in that over the top vegan way. Although I did spot an occasional hefty devotee who was probably consuming too many carbohydrates. The hefty monks certainly were not getting hefty eating city pizza or were they? <clears throat> Another phenomenon in the 1970s was the church called the process. In Philadelphia's suburban station the man in the cloak handing out copies of Process Magazine 
went about his task with calm determination, chatting up mothers, families, students, and anyone who might offer a contribution. The process man in the cape could also be seen throughout the city conducting lively debates with evangelical Christian groups. Suburban Station in the late 1970s was a teeming metropolitan. Within its walls, you could find every facet of city life, proselytizing Jews for Jesus, processing Hare Krishna devotees, Nation of Islam evangelizers, as well as expressionless, but always formally dressed Jehovah's Witness standing next to portable magazine racks. An iconic site for years was an elderly Anglo-Catholic nun in full traditional habit who sat in a folding chair inside the station. At her side was a basket for donations. Day after day, year after year, this nun would sit in silence and accept whatever money was offered her. By the early 1990s, she had disappeared, a victim of the passage of time. <clears throat> In one, visit, in one whimsical version of a cult, I talk about the cult of the pit bull. Now, it's not the breed, as some people say, it's the people who raise the dogs. This is what the pro pit campaign posters state. We are supposed to commit this, this feel good advertising to memory. We are supposed to remember this, the next time we read an awful story in the press about a pit attacking a toddler on the way home from school. We are supposed to get it straight that pits are just like any other dog. The regal greyhound, the cutest pie chihuahua, the hot dog or dash hound, or the supremely benevolent collie. Blame the awful person who taught the pit how to be an indiscriminate fighter or growler, the pro pit campaign says. The pit by itself as a blank state is as angelic as the lower order of angels. Philadelphia is pit bull heaven, sort of. Although it used to be that only the grungiest people owned them, like drug dealers, the corner tough guy, or people who just did not know any better. Pit balls were associated with crime and filth or people with little or no class. Then there was a transformation the pit bull's inherent ugliness, it's all jaw, was suddenly perceived as something beautiful. This reversal game reminds me very much of George Orwell's The Ministry of Truth in the novel 1984, standing in for its opposite, The Ministry of Lies. Now, I have, I have a very nice neighbor who has three ferocious pit bulls. These dogs are not gentle. They growl in his backyard, they chew and eat everything, one time they ate through a wire fence. When this neighbor of mine walks his pits three at a time, they storm the street ahead of him, growling, snarling, and racing as if possessed by demons. I do not know how my neighbor deals with these dogs. They are, they are so uncontrollable, he has to walk them very, very late at night. If he walked them too early in the day, they would lunge at people passing by on the sidewalk. These pits will attack anyone and everyone. At night, sometimes I hear them growling and chewing through rubber and wire. When I am on my patio, I hear them in my neighbor's house growling and clamoring to get out so they can attack something. These pits sometimes appear in my nightmares. 20 charging pit bulls in a pack, howling like wolves in Germany's black forest. There is nowhere to escape. In these dreams, I see people running their houses. The pits are coming, the pits are coming. As an animal lover, I have a hard time with pit bulls. I like my dogs to be graceful and sleek, not barrel shaped with bulbous round heads and eyes that are always defensively on the edge. I like a dog's face to not be all jaw. The all jaw look is a giveaway. This animal is about violence and death. So I hope there are no pit bull fans among you. If there are, I apologize. But as I said, that is a whimsical entry and everybody has their opinion. <laughs> um, I noticed that, that you showed some slides. Um, perhaps I, sh I should go over them. 
and tell you what they are or? Am I muted? No, Bob's, Bob's oh, muted. I'm sorry, okay. I was muted, Tom. Tom, um, your script didn't exactly follow the slides, so I didn't run them, but I can go through them quickly if, if you will talk about them. Absolutely, I just asked that you that. Great. Sure. Well, this is the cover of the book. And um, I didn't talk about Scientology tonight, but yeah. this is L. L. Ron Hubbard used to be a science fiction writer. Scientology was actually started in a town in New Jersey, not too far from Philadelphia. Oh. Um, I had some experiences with a Scientology e-meter, which uh, is something that you strap on your wrist and it's uh, connected to a machine that's supposed to gauge and register your responses to certain questions that tap your emotions. And I did this when I was 19, an older friend brought me to a uh, Scientologist. So I did this whole he-meter thing for an hour. So now when I read about e-meters, um, I can relate to that. Scientology isn't too big in Philadelphia. There's a headquarters of sorts, I think, on Ray Street. And, uh, and uh, anyway, um, the rest is in the book. <laughs> now, ACT UP, I use this, I just, I just did a column on, on AIDS in the city in the 1980s. And I it came across this photo and I use it as an example of um, political groups that band together uh, in a collective cultish fashion. And, you know, ACT UP was certainly like one of these. Um, I liked mm, a lot of the work that, uh, that um, ACT UP is, uh, ACT, UP, ACT UP did. Um, Although when I was a writer for the Welcome Mat, one of the writers there in the 80s, uh, Patrick Hazard, he is now deceased, wrote a column basically saying that, that gay people had themselves to blame for the plague. And it was quite, it was quite rude to say the least. And a lot of people called for then editor Dan Rottenberg to just fire him. And Dan Rottenberg, being a believer in free speech said, well, this is what the welcome ad is all about. You can hate a writer, you can write a thousand letters. We will publish your um, response to Mr. Hazard's column, but I'm not gonna fire him just because half the city hates him. So there were some gay columnists, I believe there was a food writer at the welcome ad who then quit in protest because the welcome app would not fire uh, Patrick Hazard. Um, I did not quit because I felt that my column was a valuable service. Um, it was a column directed at straight people in a um, mainstream alternative newspaper. And there wasn't anything like that at that time. So I stayed and I got my bushel of flack for it. <laughs> um, but I later got an apology from none other than Scott Tucker, one of the founders of um, the Philadelphia ACT UP. And we shook hands and slapped one another on the back. So it just goes to show that, that um, you can agree to disagree in a civil manner. All right, I can go to, okay. Now this, this is an interesting photo. Obviously, Mother and Father Divine about to step out of a limo somewhere in the city. Father Divine was very short. He, he was four feet something. And in a position like this, when he was out with Mother Divine, he sat on a large pillow. So he wouldn't look too short. So he's actually sitting on a very, very large pillow. It's very well covered, I think. This is Tommy Garcia at the time of his adoption 
by Father Divine. This is a whole other epic in itself. Um, Tommy Garcia was discovered by a peace mission member in California when Tommy's mother took him to a city garden. And the woman saw the boy and proceeded to show Tommy's mother some, some photographs. Well, one thing led to another. Um, the the uh, peace mission member later arranged for the adoption of this son and Tommy's sister. Um, they were brought out by car to the peace mission movement in uh, Woodmont. And uh, the story just gets crazier from there. This is Tommy Garcia all grown up with his wife, Lori. They live in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is a very early picture of Mother Divine in a dining room, probably in one of the West Philadelphia or Center City missions. She's ringing the bell right before the dinner banquet. And she always rang the bell. Mother and Father Divine together. Uh, Mother Divine in furs. This was, I think this is a fascinating, odd picture. Um, I've never seen her like this. <clears throat> but she looks quite at home, I must say. Um, she loved fur. And uh, I don't know where she was going, <laughs> but the photo was good. Mother Divine in a very, very robust, energetic walking pose, you know, Pro probably walking not into Woodmont, obviously, but into one of the uh, houses or missions throughout the city. This is Mother Divine outside of Woodmont, and this is probably after Father Divine's death. This is me visiting Mother Divine with the rosebud who, um, when I first walked into the mansion, um, I had a camera with me. So the idea was for me to interview Mother Divine and to take in the surroundings and part of taking in the, the uh, surroundings, I thought, was to take a photo of the interior. Thank God I had the good sense to ask this rosebud, I don't recall her name, if I might take a picture. Well, she nearly uh, snapped my head off. She said, no, you may not take a picture. So I complied. She later, she later became very, very nice to me, but uh, quite on the defensive initially. This is Jim Jones as a, as a self-indulgent young man, probably around the time of his, of his marriage, when he was uh, beginning his church first in South Bend, Indiana, and then in California. Um, you know, Jones had a mesmerizing power. And as I said in my presentation, he, his followers uh, believed in him so much that whatever the man wanted, they would, they would do for him. Okay, next. Well, Ira Einhorn. Um, this was his, his, his capture before his legendary escape to France and his hiding with his uh, um, woman friend. Um, so he looks, he looks rather confident there. All right, next. And the next one is um, Swami, I cannot pronounce his name, but he's famous in the Hare Krishna world as the, the preeminent yogi Swami, basically the founder of uh, the American version of Hare Krishna. There are replicas of, of him in every temple. This is Philly Jesus. Um, um, that's a great set of teeth, I must say. 
and Swami Verato, when he was editor and publisher of New Frontier magazine. Okay, next. I believe the next shot is of Swami on his deathbed holding a feather. And I must say that he looks pretty peaceful in his repose. Um, Harry Krishna on the streets of a generic city. This is not Philadelphia, but and so there's Swami again in Asheville, North Carolina. He looks younger on his deathbed, oddly enough. Um, this is a picture that, that captivated me. This is a statue of, of Satan in the Middle East, somewhere in a Middle Eastern desert. And it, it's, uh, when I saw it, I, I just thought it would make a good, a good eye-opening image for the talk about the Church of Satan. This uh, was a um, Philadelphia Weekly cover. This was a group of Philadelphia Church of Satan members who, who claim not to really believe in Satan, but they kind of play on the myth. <clears throat> and, um, but anyway, this is them having fun. I believe it, it was on the eve of, they were supposed to hold a black mass somewhere in Center City and there was quite an uproar a lot of uh, Philadelphians, I think the Archdiocese of um, Philadelphia organized protests and uh, the Black Mass never actually occurred. It was supposed to be an outdoor mass. I forget where it was supposed to be held. And I believe that the photo after this, again, we have the Philadelphia Church of Satan members hamming it up on or around Halloween in a local cemetery. So it's kind of appropriate. <laughs> and the all-loving, notorious Mr. Pitbull. <laughs> 